So we saw in the proof that um, Euler characteristic is a homotopy invariant that actually purely algebraic methods are very useful and very powerful in algebraic topology. And that's why we want to extend our um, algebraic toolbox and get to know more methods from homological algebra. And this is the excursion we want to start today and continue in the next video. So if we want to do algebra, let's fix our algebraic objects. We will always denote by R a possibly non-commutative ring now. So let R be a possibly non-commutative. Let's stress that because so far they've always been commutative. And once we admit non-commutative rings, we have to be a bit more careful when talking about modules because then it does make a difference if a module is a left module or a right module. So let us just make an agreement here and let's say that the category of R mods, this one of R modules, is not supposed to be the category of left R modules. Okay, so here's a fundamental definition of homological algebra. We will say that an R module is projective Yes, that's the definition, so let's put it in green, is projective if the following lifting, property, lif lifting problem always has a solution. So what's the problem? The problem is I'm given a subjective homomorphism of R modules, call it P, maybe P as in projection, therefore subjective. And being subjective, we now know is usually can be stated by saying um, that we have such an exact portion here. And say we're given another homomorphism of R modules, which goes to the target um, module of this um, subjective homomorphism. Then we ask, can we always find a morphism here up from P to M that makes this diagram commute? Yeah, so actually this diagram in a sense is already a definition. Yeah, so an R module P is projective if for each such di input diagram we can find this dotted area arrow here which makes everything commute. But just to be safe, let's formulate it once and for all as a sentence. So it's projective if we have the property for every epimorphism P from M to N and every homomorphism f from p to n there exists a homomorphism f twiddle from p to m such that the composition um, P after F twiddle is just equal to F. And F twiddle is not a unique map, so there no, are many choices, so it's not a universal property like Ah, yeah, so may maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's good that we still phrased it out, yes. So maybe in this diagram you might expect an existence statement, but this is here not required. Yeah? The question is, does it exist? Can you solve the problem, not can you solve it uniquely? So this is only one out of several possibilities to define this notion. And this is actually the content of the first theorem. The following statements are equivalent. Firstly, P is projective. Secondly, and this is maybe, I mean, this looks very abstract, this definition of being projective, but something which is a, sort of emotionally better because it sounds more useful and is actually more useful. Projective modules have the property that if they occur as a quotient in a short exact sequence, then the sequence is automatically split. 
And this is actually, this property is a characterization of being projective. So every short exact sequence, zero n m p, so where p appears here on the right, is the, the quotient position of the short exact sequence, every such diagram splits. Sorry, every such short, short exact sequence splits. Splitting, just to remind you, meaning we have an arrow here in the reverse direction. So let's call this one P and this one S. Uh, such that the composition first S, then P is the identity on P. Yeah. So there exists. An S, maybe S as in section from P to M, such that P after S is the identity on P. So that's convenient, all short exact sequences with P as a quotient split. And there's also a third characterization, which is also sort of more hands-on than the original um, definition. And this is just saying um, P is projective if it occurs as a direct sum and in a free um, module. So there exists another module, call it Q. such that the direct sum of the two, so such that P plus Q is a free R module. So remember free just meaning there exists a basis, yeah? a basis like in the sense of linear algebra, such that every element here in this module is a linear combination, a unique linear combination of these um, basis elements, a unique R linear combination. Okay, so why do all these three notions coincide? Let's look at the proof. So first of all, why does one imply two? So if we know that we can solve those lifting problems, why do we get that all those short exact sequences split? That's actually pretty simple. If we have such a short exact sequence, then just the lifting, probably, the lif lifting problem we want to solve is the one where we just take here as the homomorphism the identity on P. Yeah. So then this portion here of the diagram gives, gives me a lifting problem as in the original definition. And therefore I know there exists a homomorphism here from P to M. And of course this one is what I call S. And then the commutativity here in the square says precisely what I want. Yeah, it says then that going first S, then going back, this arrow here is just the identity on P. So that's clear. Why does two imply three? So we now assume that every short exact sequence splits and we want to show that P is then actually a direct summand in a free R module. And to do so, what we can always do is we can pick a subjective epimorphism from a free module. So we can pick P F going to, um, oops, to P. So if, if we don't have a better way of doing it, what we could actually do is just take the free module over all elements of P and then you have a canonical map. That would be a very inefficient way of doing it, but it's one possible way. And so such a homomorphism we pick with F free. And then we get our short exact sequence to which we want to apply the second part, which we now have as an assumption. Um, and this is just by embedding now here the kernel of this map P into F. So this is of course, if you have a subjective map, you have a short exact sequence, kernel P going to or being included in F. And there we have our projection. Yeah, let's just put it like this to P. And we know this one splits because we're assuming two, yeah? Since this one splits. We have a section here, S, and then we apply our splitting lemma, which we have, if I remember right, proven on the first exercise sheet. And I think there it was formulated for abelian groups, yeah? But actually the category of R modules, even though the ring R might be non-commutative, is what's called an abelian category. And that means that 
precisely the same proof that you found for abelian groups um, goes through also for R modules. Yeah, so precisely the same statement works. And part of this statement of the splitting lemma was that if a sequence splits, then actually the middle term is isomorphic to the direct sum of the outer terms. Yeah? And these maps here actually become inclusion and projection. So by the splitting lemma, so since this one splits, we have a direct sum comp decomposition F is isomorphic to kernel P plus um, P by the splitting lemma. Yeah, so the, the other module we were supposed to find is now just the kernel of P here. This is the Q we had to find. And finally, why does three imply one? So what do we have to show here? If P has the property that it is a direct summand in a free module, why do we have a solution to each lifting problem? Well, so to prove this, we have to give ourselves such a lifting problem. So let's draw the diagram. And instead of the zero, let me just write a double arrow here for a subjective epimorphism. And here we've got our morphism F starting at P. And we have to find now this homomorphism here using that P is actually a direct summand of a free module. So how can we use this? Well, if we know that it is such a direct summand, then well, choose a complement. So choose a Q such that P plus Q here is free. And then if we have chosen such a thing, then we have the projection map from this free module just onto this direct sum at P. Yeah, this is just the projection homomorphism. Every element here is a unique sum of two elements here. Just forget about the second sum. That's this projection map here. And now um, I'm supposed to find um, a lift here. But what I can first do is I can take the, pro the composition of these two arrows here. So let's call, give it a name. Let's call this G. And now I can first of all um, solve the lifting problem here for this G. And this I can now do easily because the module here is free. Yeah? So that means there exists a basis. And to define a homomorphism from P plus Q to N, which restricts to G, what I can do is just I pick a basis here in P plus Q. Yeah? I look where the basis elements go here in M. And then I choose whatever preimage I like along this subjective map here. Yeah? And mapping the basis element to this chosen pre-image, this now extends to a um, unique R linear homomorphism on all of this free module. Yeah? This is the usual um, argument that you already know from linear algebra. So free is easier than projective in this sense. There clearly we have um, such a lift, such a map, such that the diagram commutes here with the G. And now what I can do is I can just take as my map F twiddle here, the one I want, this here, F twiddle. I just take this map, let's call it G twiddle here, which I just constructed, and I simply restrict it to this um, direct sum in P. Yeah? So this lies included here as P plus zero, and I restrict G twiddle to P plus zero, and this gives me F twiddle. Yeah? So let's just write it here. G twiddle restricted to P. And I can, of course, identify P not T P times zero with P. Yeah, and then the commutativity of the diagram gives me that this actually is an extension of um, F, or a lift of F, I should say. OK, so that was already the proof that showed that all these three different characterizations coincide, and all these three characterizations say that an R module is projective. Now let's look at examples. So first example of a ring of a module over a ring that is not projective can be considered uh, can be constructed as follows. We take as a ring the integers z and then we say we consider z mod 2z as a z module. Yeah? I mean every abelian group is canonically a z module so this in particular is a z module just consisting of two elements and this is actually not projective.
because I can give you a short exact sequence which doesn't split and has this element, this module as a quotient module, namely I take z multiplication. Actually, why do I put two here? Let's make this more general. Kz. Yeah, I take multiplication with k here. And here I go to z mod kz. And then this is not projective for k at least two. Why not? Because if this was split, then I could find a section which would mean that z mod kz lives as a submodule of z, but it doesn't because z is torsion free and this one is not. Yeah? So this is not projective for k at least two because the short exact sequence does not split. Okay, that's one example. Maybe, um, well, I mean, positive examples are, for example, if the rings are um, fields, yeah? So if R is allowed to be a field, of course, and in that case, um, it's automatically projective. But maybe more interesting is an example of a um, projective module which is not free. So let's look at this. I don't, I don't know if I said it correctly. Did I say it correctly? I want to say over fields modules are always projective. I don't, I think I said fields were projective. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what but I said. Modules over fields. Yeah, okay. if I yeah, said it wrong, I wanted to say modules over fields are projective. Okay, so let's take as a ring the product of the field of, with two elements with itself, yeah? I mean, of course, in the category of Fields, I cannot take products, yeah, but in the category of rings, I can do it, yeah. So this is uh, a ring. And here I consider the following module, P, which is just F2 times zero. So this is actually an ideal in this ring, if you want, but ideals are actually uh, also modules over the ring. Uh, I can multiply um, every element here with uh, with an arbitrary pair of elements and I will have always get a zero again. So I will stay inside this module. So therefore this is a module over the ring F2 times F2. And this is actually also projective because I can use the direct sum characterization of the notion. If I just take um, the other module where I take zero times F2, then this together forms a free module, yes? So this is projective because um, P plus now zero times F2. Um, is free. Yeah, because it's just F2 times F2. So it's a rank one free module. So it's projective, but it is actually not free itself. And why not? Well, if it was free, it would be F2 isomorphic to F2 to the something, but that would mean, uh, sorry, it would be isomorphic to R to the something, so it would be isomorphic to F2 times F2 to the something, but that means it would, its number of elements would be a power of four. And Actually, it only has two elements, so this is a contradiction. But it is not free because P has two elements, which is not a power of four, as it would have to be if it was a free module. Yeah? 